We'll, uh, we'll get underway. We're about five past the hour and uh, glad to have many of you with us today. It looks like we have about 40 attendees for this session, which is fantastic to see. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Boudelaire. I'm the president of Ascent Strategy and uh, our organization is typically focused on helping companies grow and navigate their, uh, their strategic ambitions. Lately, we've found ourselves, like many people, focused on helping uh, people try to get through the COVID-19 pandemic. And as part of that, uh, we launched, along with some community partners, I'll tell you about in a moment, the Business Resilience Series, which has been a series of panel discussions and webinars to try to help uh, provide some insight and expertise to folks that are out there working through these same uh, challenges. So delighted to have you with us today, and uh, we'll get right into it. Firstly, I want to share a little bit about the Business Resilience Series. As I said, we felt there was a real need out there to communicate accurate and timely information about the various relief programs that were out there, especially at the early stages of the pandemic. And lately, we've started to shift our focus to the progressive reopening and the reopen Saskatchewan plan that we're all uh, optimistic about, but also uh, cautious about. It's a community-driven initiative, which is fantastic. We have a number of partners that I'll introduce in a moment. It's all volunteer, so everyone that has uh, participated in donating their time and resources to make this happen, as well as our panelists, are all giving very freely of their time, which we very much appreciate, considering that they're all very busy navigating these situations in their own businesses. And we really have one singular goal, and that's helping businesses get through this. Now, the, uh, the Business Resilience Series really only works if two things happen. The first is if we continue to get great attendance, and today, very pleased that we have many folks out there with us, which makes this very much worthwhile and worth doing. But the second piece that's quite important is it uh, works best when we get your questions. So questions from the audience uh, for our panel, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, that helps drive our conversation and hopefully shed some light on a particular issue that you're grappling with in your own organization or something you're wondering about. Uh, we wanna get that on the table so that all of our panelists can chime in. To do that, you're gonna be using the Q&A feature in the Zoom application. Might require you, depending on your device, to wiggle your mouse to get the Zoom menu to show up. And you'll see that there's a QA uh, feature. Looks like two comic book speech bubbles. And if you click on that, you're going to be able to actually submit your question and at an appropriate point in the dialogue, I'll be able to, uh, to get that into our panel and hear their perspectives on things. So I'm hoping that you'll make use of that. And this is a great time to start uh, thinking about some of the, the questions or challenges you're dealing with that you'd want the panel's perspective on. As I mentioned earlier, we have a great group of community leaders that have come together to help put this on. Uh, my organization, obviously, Ascent, I mentioned earlier. We also have the Economic Development Regina Group. Uh, they actually were quite instrumental in bringing together today's panel and this focus on the restaurant industry in particular. We have the Regina Downtown Business Improvement District, Regina's Warehouse Business Improvement District, and our friends at PATH Cowork. So very grateful for all of them and their support in helping get the word out and make this uh, series a successful one. Shifting our focus to today's agenda, really pretty straightforward discussion. We have about an hour with all of you. We'll try to bring this home at 11 o'clock sharp. We wanted to first introduce the Business Resilience Series, which we just finished up. And I do want to mention some upcoming sessions. So our, our next upcoming session is Tuesday morning next week. Uh, between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. That's our sort of standard time. If you're interested in viewing past panels, and I encourage you to uh, take a look at those, particularly if you have an interest in some of the relief programs that are available, available out there right now, uh, you can access past sessions at resilienceseries.com. You can also sign up for new sessions right there. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, you might find something uh, worthwhile and useful there. In a moment, I'm gonna introduce our panelists, and then we'll get right into a moderated discussion uh, based on your question. So again, hopefully you're starting to think about what you'd like to uh, chat with our group about. While I go through a quick disclaimer here, I'm gonna ask that our panel uh, flip their video on and unmute themselves, and then we'll uh, get right into their introductions. But first, just a quick uh, overview of some, some rules of the game, so to speak. This is a volunteer effort to provide the community with information analysis and access to expert opinion at no cost. As everyone out there knows, new information is emerging daily. The situation is very fluid. It's evolving rapidly. And every one of your business situations is going to be different. This webinar series and any recordings of it is provided for general information purposes only. It doesn't constitute legal or professional advice. And no user should act on the basis 
of any of the material in this webinar without obtaining professional advice specific to your situation. So now that we have uh, made the lawyers happy, we'll get into our introductions. And very quickly, uh, panelists, I'm not seeing your video here, so you may have to hit the start video button to turn yourselves on so we can all see your beautiful faces. Hey, Jeff, it says that we, um, that I'm not able to start my video. And the host Let's see here if we can fix that really quick. It says the host has stopped the video. Well, I don't think that I have, but we will make sure that we uh, get this sorted out real quick. One moment for technical difficulties. not had this issue before give us one moment see some questions rolling in that's excellent we'll be right back all right that should have it folks if you hit your start video button it ought to let you do that now there we go sorry about that everyone doing things the hard way and that's okay and everybody's still seeing our presentation slide just fine? Excellent. Good. Well, it's a good looking group today, so I certainly don't want to have to proceed without being able to see uh, those smiling faces. So I'm glad we got that sorted out. Thanks everyone for your patience while we did that. So let's dive right in with some introductions. So first we'll introduce Amy Schulhauser, who's the owner and founder of Schoolhouse Culinary. And Amy, maybe you could just introduce your various businesses and yourself a little bit and uh, say hi to the group. Certainly. Hello, everyone. Um, Schoolhouse Culinary Arts is the cooking school uh, business of my, my little group. I also have Tangerine, the food bar, Catering by Tangerine, and Meeting with Spice Tangerine. I've been in business for 15 years. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's great to have you with us today. Great to see you. It's, of course, great to see anybody these days. Yeah, right. <laughs> Following up, we have Matt Pinch co-founder and CEO of the Leo's Hospitality Group, which I can certainly speak for myself. I'm missing a lot these days. Matt, uh, tell us a little bit about what you have going on. I know you're actually one of the uh, rare birds that's managed to start something new in the middle of all this. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I head up the Leo's Hospitality Management Group. We oversee four brands. Uh, we're based out of Regina. We have uh, Leopold's Tavern, which is... Uh, uh, operating in four provinces, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, and BC, uh, Victoria's Tavern here in Regina, and um, Path Cowork, just happy to be a part of uh, these sessions. And uh, finally, uh, Good Eats, which, uh, as you mentioned, is something that we opened in Regina about a week ago. Good Eats is a plant-based fast food concept. So very interesting to open a restaurant in the middle of a global pandemic. I've never done that before. It'll be, a, it'll be a great chapter for the bio someday. That's right. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. Good to have you with us. Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Mark uh, von Schelwitz, who's the VP of Western Canada for Restaurants Canada. He's hoping to join us this morning. I understand there's some availability challenges, so hopefully he's able to pop in later on in the discussion, and we'll introduce him at that time. And we also have Jim Bentz, who's the president and CEO of the Saskatchewan Hotel and Hospitality Association. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Jeff, and thanks for the invitation to be part of this. Um, I as you said, uh, with the Saskatchewan Hotel and Hospitality Association, um, but we certainly represent more than just hotels. 
Um, the entire visitor economy basket uh, is part of our membership and stakeholders include, you know, folks right from convention conference centers to tourism attractions like Linus Gawain's uh, SAS Science Center. And most importantly for today's uh, discussion, uh, restaurants, uh, branded restaurants, quick service restaurants. So I'm really looking forward to participating in this, but more than anything, um, listening as well too. We've uh, had some really good, robust discussions with our government, and uh, hopefully there's a number of them on this webinar today, uh, because you know as we move towards the reopening, um, you know being able to perhaps have input or influence on how it is that requirements or restrictions look um, could be really important for uh, those folks that decide to reopen, uh, and hopefully it's in, in June. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hopefully doing more listening than talking today, but uh, I certainly welcome any questions. Jim, you're going to have to talk. That was part of the deal of being a panelist. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So on that note, as I said, we have some questions rolling in. I really encourage people to get those in there because the more that this format is driven by questions from folks out in the field, the better off it will be. But this group had an opportunity to get together in advance of the session and chat a little bit about what people's experiences have, have been. And what kind of fell out of that is that there's sort of three major topics that we're hoping we can I uh, used to frame the discussion today and I'll go through them really quickly and then we'll start off a bit of a, uh, a chat about each one. As you ask questions, I will sort of keep track of them and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we fit them into the appropriate juncture in the conversation and we'll try to keep it flowing. And certainly if there are uh, little um, alleyways that we go down because of some of those questions, that's great too. There's a lot of great insight that comes out of those. So the first thing we want to talk, chat, chat about today this is just a quick recap of sort of the road so far. I'm just interested from some of our panelists, sort of how they've adapted to this pandemic, what they might have learned, and any insights that they feel would be worthwhile sharing with our community that's joined us today. I think the bulk of our discussion will focus in on the second topic, which is folks' perspectives on the reopen Saskatchewan plan. As Jim just mentioned, we still don't really have clarity around a specific date we're working towards, but I think there's hope that it'll be sometime in June with some interesting restrictions that will make up our new normal for a while. And I know many restaurants are looking at, you know, can I make a go of this at a reduced capacity? Can I make a go of this in light of new costs I might incur and new rules I'll have to observe? And I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, discussion in that section. And then lastly today, we wanna round out with the panel's perspectives on what additional support uh, that the industry might require in the longer term to get through this. I know certainly our, our sessions to date have largely been focused on small and medium sized business from a general perspective. Um, restaurants have a lot of common with normal businesses, but obviously have a lot of very unique things when it comes to the pandemic to deal with. One of the things we're hearing a lot in these discussions is that, you know, it's been great that there has been a, a strong response from the federal government, let's say, on, on programs that help in March, April, May. Um, but beyond that, there's not a lot of clarity around what might be out there and there's not a lot of knowledge about how we should be considering potential future relief in our plans to uh, to begin operating again. So we'll be very interested in the panelists discussion there. Okay, excellent. So last bit, again, want to emphasize this, ask those questions. That's going to be the way that this is a really great and uh, meaty conversation. So let's dive in and um, we'll probably start with you, Matt, if I can. Tell us a little bit about where you're at today and uh, what the road's been like so far and, and what have you learned? I know you mentioned in your introductory remarks, you guys opened Good Eats, which is pretty exciting. I know after a brief hiatus, you're back to the takeout game with two of the Leo's locations here in town. What's, uh, what's sort of been the, the takeaway so far and what are the key insights that uh, you've generated through the process? I mean, uh, frankly, it's been a bit of a blur for six weeks, but um, uh, on the positive side, I think that uh, as a local business operator, and I'm sure Amy would echo this, that, you know, we've really realized that the community wants to support these local, small, independent operators. Um, and and we've, we've been tremendously uh, uh, surprised and, and grateful for how many people have, have supported us with our limited takeout offering at Leo's as we reopened about a week and a half ago. And then, like we said, with Good Eats, um, we felt very confident in what we were seeing in Saskatoon. Good Eats is a brand that started in Saskatoon and was operating in takeout and delivery only. And the support from the customers um, uh, was amazing. And it really gave us the confidence to make an attempt to um, 
uh, open a restaurant here in Regina and we've been impressed as well here. Um, the support has been really tremendous as well from customers. So I think that's one big takeaway for me is, and a big positive is that, you know, people in, in individual communities are really eager to support the local small businesses around them. And I think now, now more than ever in the future that we'll, we will definitely see more of that. Um, you know, I think the other big thing for me is, you know, we realize uh, a small restaurant has so many moving parts to it and really is just a vast amount of partnerships. Um, down to the suppliers, uh, the landlords, uh, your staff. Uh, there's so many stakeholders in a small uh, independent restaurant. And, and I think we've all learned through this that we really are all in this together. Um, and that if there's uh, anyone who wants more than the other, it really doesn't work. So we've been very uh, happy and grateful as well that you know, most of our, our partners, landlords and, and suppliers and, and certainly staff have st stood with us and been very supportive of us uh, over the last six weeks. Excellent. And Amy, how does that compare with your experience? Are you folks still operating? How have you changed things and, and how's it working so far? Well, uh, before the pandemic, a third of our, our business at Tangerine was takeaway anyway. We have a lot of proximity to office buildings and parks and people would just grab and go. So that part was already um, ingrained in our customers' minds. And so they look to us for takeaway options right away and we, we haven't closed for a day since this all um, came down like no extra days so that part was good now with my business being free pronged with catering that screeched to a halt completely didn't just de decrease catering is at zero um, and then uh, schoolhouse we have pivoted to online classes which are extremely popular they're all sold out and so we're getting a little bit of revenue that way um, because of the overwhelming response again gratitude comes into this like you said matt so so much um we were we were kind of caught um with oh now what okay we've had to change our business model on that particular side of business a hundred percent so um there's been a ton of adjustments it takes a lot of um energy and mental load to to deal with all of those things especially as how vastly different the, the operating models are for those three businesses um, but getting back to tangerine and the restaurant side of things we have um, a, a, an okay takeaway business and deliveries have um, have uh, been off and on too. It depends. It depends on what we're offering and what what day of the week it is and all sorts of things. One thing I have noticed for sure is you have to be relentless in social media and remind people all the time that you're still there. Um, I had a food supplier come in and say that they one of their fast food outlets that they deliver to has increased sales by 300%. Wow. And so that was a bit disheartening. There is a huge response to what we're doing in the smaller places. But if a place that is, um, I imagine it's, it's across the board for fast food, that they're 300% better than what they have been, you know, maybe there's some room for an improvement on on getting the word out there that we're still open, we're still here, and maybe shift some of that spending into some of the more um, independent space. Interesting. I'm curious too, from the two of you, before I, I ask for what you're hearing from the industry, Jim, what's the experience been working with your, your teams? I mean, obviously to continue operating, you folks have to have your, your people working in kitchens and working in the facility. They obviously have different levels of comfort and concern with what's going on. Your customers probably do as well. What's been the experience with your teams? Have you guys had to, uh, you know, reduce your headcount? Have you had to change your practices to make people comfortable coming to work? Just maybe give me a bit of a sense of that. Yeah, for us, um, you know, just w w when the when this initially started, uh, we basically decided to temporarily lay off our entire workforce, just because at that point, you know, we just didn't understand um, what was happening and how long this is going to last, and cash flow was obviously a massive concern. Um, for me, you know, I've been I've been very impressed with uh, my team, and and, and uh, I even asked a lot of them to to continue working if they were able and if they felt like it, even for no pay. And uh, all of them said, "Sure, happy to help." Uh, they really had nothing else to do, I suppose. So uh, now we're kind of returning um, some people to payroll. You know, we're taking advantage of the wage subsidy program, but I, I think uh, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to make some permanent changes, and are starting to think that way as well. Um, regardless of the sub three that are out there with the reduction in revenue. It's just simple math. You have to start to reduce your workforce. And, and that's concerning as we head into sort of a new era of what, uh, you know, the, the reopening plan looks like, because the reality is I feel like I'm doing five more jobs than I used to nowadays. And I'd like to have a lot more people, frankly, 
Um, so I think that's definitely a challenge for, for business owners now is, you know, they can't afford to have the people to help do more work. Uh, and so that's something we're all going to face for a while here. Yeah, certainly we've observed that in our business and with a lot of the, uh, the businesses we work with, that all of a sudden, you know, these operators that were running great operations and were just sort of staffed up to the right capacity to manage all of the administrata and all this kind of stuff that goes with it. Now it's a whole second full-time job navigating government programs and learning new regulations and the, uh, the impact of that's fairly significant. Amy, tell us a little bit about your experience with, uh, with the team and staff and that sort of thing. Yeah, we, I laid off um, from, I have five employees right now, all in the full time actually. So that was a nice, a nice bonus to get the operations of the day done. Uh, I laid off probably about 15 people all across the board. And some of them I, I, I think will be permanent, um, it, at least for now and for the foreseeable future. I can't see it getting to full capacity for a while. As for um, their safety and their health, we do. We are lucky enough to be able to work six feet apart, sometimes more. We're very aware of each other's spaces. Um, we've set up in the Tangerine um, dining room itself. The tables are now in the middle of, this, of the um, dining room so that it's, you can't help but social distance. Uh, we, being in a kitchen anyway, everyone washes their hands a lot anyway, that part of it hasn't changed and um, I'm glad to see that people are still adhering to it. We're doing extra um, sanitation, of course, and not once has anyone felt unsafe and I ask all the time, you know, first of all, how are you feeling today? Um, is this okay for you to do that? We do deliveries, we wear gloves, we, um, we are very respectful of the rules here and I haven't had anything to the contrary come up. Now, it could be a special case of that they just haven't stopped working, so they haven't had a chance to go home and get used to the Netflix and the, the wh whatever else they were doing. So that's just 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 the way it is, thankfully, because it would be it's hard to change um, attitudes. Some of the ones the uh, employees that I've been recalling are like, "No, nah, I'm good. I you know I, I I don't think I need to come back just yet." And uh, so that, that's been a whole other discussion and some, some looking into bylaws or, or to, to laws and um, how EI works. But uh, for the most part, I think we are in a good space right now as a workforce in, in, under this roof. And um, I just hope it continues and we can, we can keep this, this going. I can keep adding gradually to the, to the team. Yeah, I know the, uh, the CERB program, I think, has been welcome relief for a lot of folks that find themselves without jobs, but has now sort of created this interesting circumstance for some folks where, uh, you know, they're, they're doing maybe a little better than they might normally have done, especially if they were part-timers. So uh, getting them to come back until that runs out might be a bit tricky. Jim, I'm curious. I mean, I suspect your phone's ringing off the hook these days, and you're hearing from a lot of folks that are in difficult circumstances. You know, what are some of the big takeaways that, uh, that you're hearing and some of the the challenges that people are still working through where maybe there are gaps that still remain? Yeah, it, I mean, certainly uh, our industry is one that's, you know, it's very adaptive and can be very nimble. So we're seeing lots of pockets of creativity and how people are taking this situation and really um, you know, modifying their, their service delivery model in a way that'll allow them to continue to, to do business. And I think that that adaptivity and creativity um, is not just at the service side of it, like consideration of how it is that we can, you know, deliver our service uh, in a safe way to our customers, but um, it goes right back to the kitchen. What, what is that going to look like now as we ramp up on the production side and as well as the supply chain? And I think that uh, one of the pieces that I'm enjoying from a, from a provincial perspective, I shouldn't say enjoying, but our government uh, seems to be extremely receptive to, um, uh, suggestions with regards to policy, you know, some of those things that would make it, uh, you know, it as this horizon line comes forward, you know, making changes to policy and regulations and uh, legislation, maybe even so that we can um, not just survive this, but then continue to thrive once we get out. So, um, so the communication piece, as you had mentioned, um, yes, it's been extremely busy um, and for good reason. I think that uh, when, we, when people call in to talk about their concerns, Certainly commercial rent protection is, is one of the biggest thing uh, issues on people's minds is, you know, um, every time we come closer to the first of the month, you know, um, um, are people going to be able to make their rent and our landlords being 
uh, receptive to some of the um, uh, some of the programs that have been launched. You know, some have, some haven't. So there, we're going to continue to struggle with that a little bit, I think. Um, you know, and again, too, having having the year of government on these pieces, uh, but you know, I think that there's some federal uh, influence on that as well, too. So that you know, in times like this, there are frustrations, but uh, there's also uh, opportunities to uh, you know to influence some of that change. I think one of the other um, uh, challenges that we've got coming for us is on the side of the uh, the temporary layoff. So before the COVID crisis, we didn't have a provision in our legislation uh, that provided for a temporary layoff. So if you had, you know, as Amy had said, 15 staff and you had to lay them off, well, you, you have to cut a check to them for severance on that. Um, uh, minister Morgan, uh, our justice minister, made some changes so that now we have a temporary provision uh, for 12 weeks. Now, um, the challenge with that is, is that that 12 weeks is, is, is coming fast. And so for those that you can't bring back, um, you are obligated to, you know, to make sure that they're compensated um, uh, fairly. So those have been ongoing discussions as well, too, is, you know, how is it that we can stretch that runway out uh, further? Because we simply, it's just uh, those kinds of payments would just um, uh, be, well, in some cases, impossible to pay. So, um, and again, this is, this is like our industry, um, our ability to be able to have good conversations and influence change is going to be paramount in this next, in this next while. So whether it's on uh, requirements or restrictions on how we um, uh, deliver, serve, serve our customers uh, to uh, policy changes that we should, we could hopefully make. Yeah. I appreciate your comments, particularly about the uh, sort of severance deferral. And it, it reminds me of all these other deferrals that are coming on and that I think people sometimes confuse a deferral with forgiveness and we got to, be a little bit careful that there's still not a lot of clarity of when those might come due. The other thing you mentioned that I'm curious for Amy and Matt's perspectives on is the, the commercial leases. You know, uh, I know, I suspect both of you uh, have leases, Matt, I know your operation leases lots of space all over different cities and different landlords. How have you been uh, dealing with the, the fixed cost overhead problem and, and trying to get some relief on that front? Maybe Matt, we'll start with you and then loop back to Amy. Yeah, um, you know, so I have 14 landlords that I've been uh, feel like I'm negotiating with every day. Um, you know, it's it's really a, a wide range. Generally, um, my landlords have been pretty supportive, but you know, I also understand that they have businesses to run as well. Um, I think one thing we all agree on is that the commercial rent relief program announced so far has really not uh, offered much help. Uh, it's kind of voluntary from the landlord's position and the landlord just sort of saying, I don't want to give up 25% of the rents for three months. And, and I think restaurants are saying, I don't want to pay 25% of the rents for three months. Uh, so I think in general, that program hasn't really offered uh, much guidance or much support. Uh, and so it's just back to, you know, good old fashioned negotiation between a landlord and a tenant. And uh, I think landlords, you know, certainly want to be supportive because they want these restaurants to return and, and, and remain. And, and I think they, they need to be careful uh, in that if that restaurant fails, uh, who's going to be there to backfill them? Probably not not many uh, right now and for the foreseeable future. So it's certainly been one of my greatest challenges is in dealing with the real estate side of things uh, and trying to manage the overhead and manage the costs and, and, and come up with, uh, you know, solutions that make sense for both parties. And uh, certainly having a bunch of different landlords and different jurisdictions has made it even more challenging, but also kind of interesting to see how everyone responds and, and see the creative solutions that are flowing from, from different, these different groups. Thanks, Matt. Amy, how about yourself? What's, uh, what's been the commercial rent negotiation situation? Well, I own my building. So, oh, excellent. so is the landlord uh, easy to negotiate with then? Or? Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> the <landlord's> tough. <laughs> it's mortgaged. So um, my, the mortgage is held privately um, with a, a the, the former owner and so I've had to um, just tell him to not deposit the check you know so in a way I guess it is like like a lease anyway and he's he's great to deal with so he he delayed it and he said um, you know if it's if it's next month if it's October no no big deal the, the problem then becomes there's two in October or up until then and uh, uh, luckily, I've been able to um, access the, the, the loan, the $40,000 loan uh, from the federal government. So that has come in handy. The fixed costs are the ones that are the real pain. The variable we can handle, things are, are um, portioned out, I guess you would say, uh, according to the business that we're doing. But um, I had to pay a $2,500 insurance um, premium for 
um, for another of my properties. So it's been it's been really tough that way when there's no actual revenue coming in and then you still have these ones. Insurance is not um, willing to negotiate, so that was a, that was a tough one. Um, but yeah, it it does come down to relationships and um, negotiation and and making sure that everyone's covered and there's there's no gaps there. One of the great ironies of the pandemic that insurance is reluctant to negotiate and equally reluctant to pay out anything, it would seem. Yeah. Well, one question came in from the uh, audience here, and I think it's relevant to how you've adapted business uh, models. And Jim, curious for what you're hearing as well from your, your broader membership. But uh, this individual indicates they've never really done the takeout food delivery game and never used, you know, the skip the dishes or the Uber Eats or the DoorDash type services. And they're, they're sort of asking, I think, for your, your opinions or recommendations on whether or not they ought to do that and, and if, if it would benefit their business. And I know there's right now lots of interesting press about the cut that some of these organizations are taking. And people are maybe being woken up to the fact that uh, a lot of uh, the money ends up in somebody else's jeans on some of those deals. What's been your experience, given that takeout has become kind of the, the cornerstone operating feature that's left in your operations right now pending a reopen? Uh, was that was that for me, Jeff? Oh, I mean, I'm encouraging everyone to chime in, uh, Jim. If you want to start off, why don't we uh, do that? Yeah, it, it's th this is one of those aspects of the business that really is um, there's one on each shoulder. That um, it, it's a space that uh, uh, that many operators I hear from uh, they reluctantly engage in because the commissions are so high, and with um, you know with food costs and, you know, Amy and Matt can certainly speak to this far better than I can. Uh, but once that, uh, that meal is prepared and it's uh, out the door, um, the cost on that, the, the margins are very thin as it is. And when on the, um, you know, with those different um, applications taking their commission, then it really does become really tough, I think, uh, to, to be profitable in that sphere. And so, but if you don't play in that space, um, then you don't get the exposure either. So it really is a it's sort of a, it's a double-edged sword, um, much the same as in hotel world with um, online travel agencies. Same, same thing. There's, a, there's, there's been an opportunity to sort of hijack that path to purchase uh, in which, and, and again, keeping in mind, what do the consumers want? A lot of them now, um, they're very quick to pick up their phone and use some of those applications because they're comfortable with it. Um, many times they don't realize that every time they do that, it significantly cuts into any kind of profitability that Amy or Matt may have. Um, so uh, many have started um, down the path of if somebody comes in um, or if an order goes out, um, how is it that they communicate? What's that relationship like with that customer? Takes tons of work, but letting them know that if they order directly, um, that there there could be an opportunity for them to, you know, for the for the local person uh, to you know, keep more money in their jeans. It's not about what you make, it's what you keep, you know, and yeah. on, particularly on that revenue side, hey, managing your expenses. So um, I, I, from what I'm hearing from uh, my restaurant members, it's um, it's a space that they're they're in and sometimes quite reluctantly, uh, but they're, they're also as reluctant to try to get out of that because then they don't have the exposure. So, but I'll, I'll leave the rest of that uh, this time uh, for Amy and Matt and, and hear their thoughts. Yeah, Matt, Amy, are you using these services and uh, are you doing it direct yourself? What's the experience been? Yeah, so it's been uh, interesting for us. So before COVID, uh, we at Leopold's were not using any of these services. Again, we, you know, we built our business based on the idea of community and human connection. And we wanted people to come enjoy their meal, you know, with a beer inside our stores. So that was always part of our strategy. And then when COVID hit, we found ourselves at a pretty big disadvantage not having um, that availability. Uh, when we first tried to do takeout uh, for sort of the first week, we actually just used the old fashioned phone and pickup situation. And then what we realized pretty quickly is that um, that was actually a big concern for the health and safety of our staff. And, you know, that being our number one concern, what we realized is when people were coming to pick up, there was a lot of contact happening, whether it was the payment or the contact with the customer. And so one of the decisions that we made and why we chose to move to the delivery services is that that actually eliminated that contact point with, with the customer and it improved the safety uh, and uh, the, com the comfort of our staff who are in store because when you do, do use the delivery services that payment has to be made via the delivery service and then the transaction is simply just to hand the food to the driver and the driver takes the food and, and uh, moves on so that was sort of interesting for us to understand that but uh, certainly you know what you were saying Jim is true 
Um, these costs, these delivery costs are upwards of 30%. Uh, you know, when you're running uh, takeout delivery as is, your food costs are already rising. Of course, you need to include takeout containers and cutlery and those sorts of things, which already increase the cost. So the, the profits are, are very thin and very low. I do think uh, these delivery companies are going to face mounting pressure to lower their fees and probably will face a, a disruption in a number of ways. Uh, you know, we're, we're back to reevaluating um, what we can do to encourage people to come in and pick up their food so that we can keep, uh, you know, those, those keep that additional 30% that otherwise would have been going to the delivery companies. But for now, we basically felt like we had no choice. This was the best way to ensure the health and safety of our staff, and it was the best way to continue to generate revenue uh, and keep people employed. Muted myself. Sorry, the kids are making a little bit of noise behind me. Amy, are you using these services or are you doing it uh, direct? Absolutely not. I am so opposed to these kinds of things. I find them shameless and, and like the check cashing um, versions of, of delivery. It's um, I understand why people are on them and I don't judge those because I totally get it. However, we turned off this into an opportunity for us. We have and have had for a bunch of years now um, an iPhone that is just used for our social media. It has its own phone number and everything. I had to I had to get it like registered that way. We took that phone and made it our hotline. People could call, people could text. People don't like talking on the phone. So we made it easy for them to text us to order what we had um, in correspondence to um, what we had on our social media. They're able to pick up uh, or have their orders delivered. We had our the person handling this work from home. She took the debit machine from our catering side and used it at home and was able to take credit card payments or they could do an e-transfer. We just, we had to make it easy. We had to make it as easy or just about as easy as those apps in order to compete with it and still save that 30% for, for us. Now I understand a lot of people don't have the, the luxury of having a hotline or a separate number. We happen to have that already built in and, and thank goodness because we were able to pivot with that within a couple of days to, to use it solely for that. It saved our people from answering the phone, it saved the contact with paying when they came in. Everything was just set on a table. They'd come in or they'd call and we'd run out. So that way we are able to, um, to at least play in that space. I wouldn't say compete, but definitely um, it's an option for the people who, for, who are hesitant to leave their house and, and still wanted to get food delivered. Excellent. Thank you. It's actually, it's remarkable how in the midst of this pandemic, the, uh, the phone has even gone further the way of the dinosaur. It's text or now what used to be a phone call. For some reason, people think you have to do a video conference. You must yes. see one another. Very strange new reality. And speaking of new reality, let's move into our second topic. And this is where I want to focus the bulk of our discussion. We have lots of good questions coming in from the, uh, the crowd. Which are your perspectives on sort of reopen Saskatchewan and, and plans to operate in the new normal? And I know Matt, when we chatted previously, you folks at Leo's, I think, have broken sort of your considerations down into four big categories that I think are a useful frame for the discussion. You had sort of the financial considerations where I, I want to jump off with a, an opening question, your operations, the health and safety side, and then, you know, marketing communications, reaching out to folks, dealing with some of the stuff, Amy, you were just mentioning around educating that you're here and that, you know, business is open. I'm curious on the financial side, you know, we're looking at the reopen Saskatchewan plan in phase three, there's some opportunity for you folks to reopen with major capacity restrictions. On the financial side of those, how are you sort of gauging the economics of um, reopening or not when you can? Because I've heard from a lot of folks anecdotally that there's a lot more ways to lose money being 50% open than there are being 100% closed. And, uh, you know, Matt, I'm kind of cribbing from your notes here, so maybe we'll start with you. Uh, I think the financial side of things is uh, very difficult and certainly very uh, hard to predict. Uh, it starts with the top line, with revenue. Uh, does 50% capacity mean 50% of your revenue, or does it mean 30%, or does it mean 60 You know, I, I think that that's what the biggest challenge for us right now is to understand what that'll look like. Uh, you know, from there, I, I think that, you know, the most uh, independent restaurants have, uh, you know, taken the $40,000 loan from the government. I, you know, a lot of that's going to be gone by the time uh, restaurants reopen because they're using that to replenish their supply, replenish their stock and their inventory. Uh, they probably use some of that to maintain, you know, the property tax and op costs with their landlords over the course of time. So I, I think that, you know, that's uh, kind of an issue in that, uh, you know, that 40,000, frankly, might not be enough for a lot of restaurants to get reopened. 
um, uh, you know, we're trying to understand labor and how to forecast for labor. And really, uh, we think we're going to have to have more labor effectively because there's going to have, have to be more attention placed on cleaning. Um, we're trying to do as much social distancing as possible inside our stores, which are not large, uh, you know, footprints as is. So certainly uh, trying to forecast uh, the labor component is difficult as well. Um, from financially. So, you know, it's a big challenge um, for us. That's why we, we decided we had to get into the takeout delivery game because we need to find ways to bolster our revenue outside of the store, you know, anticipating that inside of the store is going to be pretty uncertain for, for the time being, at least with the 50% capacity rules. Have you concluded one way or the other what you'll do when the uh, time comes? Yeah, we're, we sort of have a two-phase approach right now. We're working towards getting all of our stores open for takeout and delivery. Um, and we think that's a good way to kind of uh, carefully shake off the rust with our staff, get them back into the building uh, in a kind of a confined environment, make sure that, you know, we, we've established our habits in terms of cleanliness and, and, you know, changes. Like Amy said, you know, kitchens are always meant to be clean places and always are. But, you know, any of the changes that we want to be making inside uh, the store related to, you know, um, hand washing every 10 minutes, uh, those sorts of habits that we want to establish, we think it's a good way to get going and get up and running first. And then once we are, are well, uh, we're running with our takeout delivery services, we're going to be reopening. Um, and we don't really know our time frames yet. We're trying to be patient. We're trying not to uh, rush into anything. We're trying to really have a clear plan to make sure that our customers know that we're taking this seriously and that the health and safety of our staff and of our customers are first and foremost. I think, I think the challenge for restaurateurs is that what is the cost of that and uh, how much are we expected to, you know, uh, to incur in costs to um, create the, the, the situation for health and safety inside the stores before it's just not feasible anymore. So that's something we're certainly weighing is, you know, what are, what are the additional costs and, and what's important and what's going to be key. And we're taking that very seriously. Obviously. And I know uh, Matt, one thing that you and Amy have in common is that your, your model features some intimate spaces where, you know, accommodating a 50% reduction might be tricky. So Amy, I'm, I'm curious from your vantage point, you know, looking at a space envelope that's, like I said, pretty intimate, your capacity is sort of what it is, slashing that dramatically is going to have a pretty big impact. What are the uh, considerations that you're weighing? We're moving outside. Uh, we're lucky now that uh, summer is coming up. We have a, um, if anyone knows where we're located, we have a lot of sidewalk space in front of our building and onto um, the, uh, the length of the, of the building. So I'm getting a lot of outdoor um, tables and chairs and world space mode accordingly and I think that should help make up the difference somewhat um, again like I mentioned we have a lot of takeout uh, business as it is so I'm, I'm grateful for that and I hope that continues as more people come in to, to work on at, in their um, like the businesses repopulate around here and hopefully that'll, that'll bring in uh, more more of that business the the we have to really redefine and, and rethink the spaces that we're in. And for us, we're able to have, we're not as um, closely packed per se as um, as some maybe a, like um, say Leo's or uh, or Vic's Tavern where it's it's good to be close together and, and to, to share um, a night out. So for, for that, we'll take out every second table. Uh, it shouldn't be that much of an impact, I would say, um, fingers crossed, I think, what the barrier we're looking at right now is people's confidence in leaving their homes and in, in being in, a, in one room with other people and, and getting over the, um, and rightfully so, getting, getting over the, the um, anxiety of being out and about these days. So, I mean, just building on that anxiety piece, I mean, I know there's, there's a real interesting educational challenge out there to when it's time to open, educate your customers that you are open and then maybe provide them some reassurance that you're taking all the steps necessary to make sure that it's going to be a safe experience for them. And there's lots of questions starting to come in around, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, new sanitation procedures, PPE, that sort of thing. One came in uh, specific to the hotel industry, Jim, that's maybe an interesting place to start. I'd be curious if restaurants are going to be the same way. You know, someone's asking, are we going to need to be, you know, disinfecting rooms and, you know, fogging spaces and that sort of thing every day? And is that part of our new reality? And I suppose you could ask the same question of shared spaces and restaurants and whatnot. I'm curious what folks are already doing to prepare 
to have new procedures in place and whether or not there's enough clarity right now or instruction available about what the standards really are and what your responsibilities are going to be as operators to meet them. So, you know, maybe we'll touch on that hotel question that came in from the, the audience there, Jim, and then, you know, bounce around about those two questions. Sure. And hotels have not, uh, they're, in a, they're an allowable service. So hotels have continued um, for those that have been able to, there's been many that have uh, shut their doors, They've got tremendous um, overhead, you know, a full service hotel in downtown Regina uh, will have fixed costs of over $200,000 a month. Well, there's, you know, whether you're a branded hotel, but many of our, many of those hotels are also uh, family owned, right? A lot of people don't realize that even though it carries a flag, um, there's tremendous expense. So those that have stayed open, there is, um, and there has been since this started, uh, some very specific protocols and procedures around how it is that you um, um, provide a safe environment. It's really about, it's the confidence of the customer to be able to go into a place and right from the moment they walk up to understand they can even smell it in the air. Uh, if, it, if there's disinfectant, normally that would have turned a guest off. Now we're finding that that's actually, um, it's a good thing. So they come in and they can, they, they can tell usually by the cleanliness of the lobby um, that uh, there's probably protocols in place. And when it does come to the room, if there is, um, you know, uh, if somebody self declares that they're self isolating, that they may be infected there's ways that, that the hotel will treat that room and how it is entered and by who. Um, and if there's somebody that's quarantined, self-quarantined, well, that's a whole other matter uh, altogether. Um, so there is protocols around all of those pieces in a hotel because we've been dealing with those situations since the start of this. Um, what's going to be new for the restaurant industry, of course, is that we are reopening. Um, so what does cleanliness look like um, before we reopen? Um, what are the protocols that will be for as we mentioned before, for the service of the food. What does is, what is 50% capacity actually mean? Um, we put forward uh, um, uh, the suggestion that perhaps 50% might be too stringent in the sense that some restaurants, that might not be workable, depending on what, how they're, if there's fixed booths, all of those things. Um, so um, we've suggested that perhaps, uh, you know, um, submitting floor plans that would say, hey, look at here's what our restaurant looks like. Here's a floor plan. It might be 55%, it might be 45, but allowing the operator to be able to make decisions based on their, on their footprint. Um, we're getting a lot of conversations around, well, will the customer feel safer? And is it safer to be outdoors? And to Amy's uh, point, um, as jurisdictions around North America and even around the world are reopening uh, in the food service business, um, they really seem to be looking towards that. Uh, it sounds like the, uh, the staff feel a bit safer. Um, there's still worries that maybe this is aerosol in the sense that, you know, um, so is there an opportunity in Saskatchewan for the government to help us to say, look at here's what we're going to, or municipal, from municipal governments, um, this is what your floor plan can, can move into. So if you've got space beside your business that you could really create a new patio situation in which people feel they're outdoors, they can social distance, they feel a little bit more comfortable, they're more confident about the safety of the, the environment, um, right down to a staff level as well. You know, they're, so our governments are being receptive to those kinds of ideas. And I think that uh, right down to food trucks, I saw it was one out of the States where a, a, a restaurant had forever, generations been, you know, sort of in this model of here's my dining room, you know, in-room dining. Uh, and now they've got this amazing food truck out front that uh, gives all of the opportunity to be able to, uh, for customers to enjoy the, their unique menu offerings, uh, but then some tables out front as well too. So I, I think again, back to that idea of adaptability and creativity, we're gonna see a lot more of that happening. And I, and I do think that uh, part of that future will be outdoor environment. Did I answer your question, Jeff? I mean, we yeah, I mean with... you, you answered my question, and I think you answered a couple other ones I had. So it was a, it was a meaty answer. But I mean, the, the getting like the core of the question was, you know, what are we doing to gear up? Do we have the stuff we need? Do, and I guess almost more importantly, and you started to touch on it at the end there, uh, Jim. Do we have the guidelines or the direction around what we need to be doing as operators? And are we getting enough information on that front? Because I mean, what we've heard anecdotally is that you know stuff's coming, it's getting better all the time, but it's still sparse and there was a question that came in that i think ties into it and maybe from the operator standpoint it's a an interesting lens for the question i know right now nobody wants to be the uh the headline nobody wants to be the the restaurant where somebody unfortunately contracted something and they traced it back and and now you've got a bit of an optics issue how are you bouncing balancing you know those considerations as operators matt and amy 
And do you have enough info that you can really feel confident you're, you're doing all the right things? And if something ever did happen, you could, you could you know, mount a credible defense that you were doing all the right things and, and going above and beyond to keep people safe. Uh, and that you know, someone got sick anyway, which is, I suppose, one of the unfortunate realities about this pandemic. So uh, Amy, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I don't have a plan per se for that. Uh, I, that that's a that's a big question to work through and a big um, response to it. I will say though, I, um, I I take bits and pieces of all the news that I've heard, like um, a restaurant HVAC system uh, circulated the air and then people got sick that way. I went and got allergen um, specific furnace filters for for my my building here and. Um, I think it comes down to a strong communications plan and letting people know what you are doing to prevent it, making it, um, put it on your website, what have you. And then as these these little pieces come come to, to you, you can formulate a, a, just a solid plan that you can use going forward. I don't think we have anything that's comprehensive just yet. And maybe that's up to the individual operator to, to provide that. Um, and so with, with that in mind, if someone does get sick, I think that you you do have that that evidence or the backup that you did do all the things that you were supposed to do that are um, reasonable and and that um, moving forward here's what we're going to do as well. Um, again, I, I hope to God that no one has to go through that. Um, I'm sure some some will, of course, and I think we can maybe look towards other examples that have happened in the past, like a McDonald's employee or or other other things that have come up in the news and, and see what's going on there. I know I was at Superstore in the in the south here and after they had closed for cleaning and there was a sm strong smell of leach even a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. So further to Jim's point, um, having that evidence, even if it's, um, it's visible, you can smell it, different things like that. You see your employees wearing gloves, you see um, this, that, and the other, always, always, always cleaning. That'll help go um, a long way, especially in the early stages of the reopen. You know, Matt, building on that, obviously curious for your perspective on it, and then we're going to use the last few minutes we have together to talk about gaps. But you know, how's the experience of going to a Leo's likely to change as we adapt and add these PPE requirements in? And do you think when reopening happens that the demand is going to be there? I mean, I know you hear to Amy's point the headline about a McDonald's drive-through, and you think to yourself, you know, maybe I was overestimating how safe that was. It has an interesting effect on consumer psychology. What's the, what's the sense at Leo's? Yeah. I mean, you know, certainly we're concerned about the risks of, of uh, you know, uh, something happening in a store or being traced back to a store. But I think for restaurant operators, if you're concerned about that risk, the only way to eliminate that is to wait till there's a vaccine. And if you're going to wait that long, you'll be broke anyways. So we all have to get back to work. We all have to do what we're, we're you know, the reason we're entrepreneurs is because we adapt and we innovate and we have to start doing that. Um, for us, we're trying to just tackle some simple things. And one of the you know key aspects we're working on in the store to sort of increase safety and confidence for our customers is eliminating these touch points. So um, we're going to move to a cashless business. You know, if you think of cash, a lot of people touch cash every day. And I think that, you know, there's no need to continue to have cash in our business. We can operate normally without it. So we're making that move, which will be permanent. Uh, we're going to remove cash from our business completely. Um, menus are another thing. You know, we have menus and you can imagine how many people touch a menu over the course of a visit. We're actually exploring the idea of not offering menus anymore to our customers. We're, we're going to be limiting our menu when we return to business. Uh, we might use a TV or two to show a menu, or we might ask people to just grab their own phone and bring up our menu online. Uh, that eliminates the touch point. These are really simple things we can do. Um, obviously, masks, hand sanitizers, those sorts of things we're evaluating. Um, so we're doing all we can and, and really just adapting and, and coming up with our own plans that make sense for our own business. Because to your other question about guidelines, I don't think they're there. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of guidelines that we're supposed to follow and, and there's nothing published that we can follow. And that may be a good thing actually, because everyone, uh, everyone has uh, different spaces and everyone has different needs. Uh, but in a way it would be nice to have a little more direction and that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of consumer confidence. Yeah, I, I do. I think people are, uh, the one thing people are missing most right now is human connection. And uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that people are going to want to get back out to visit with friends and in a space and to see other people, to see strangers, uh, you know, to, to plug the jukebox at Leo's and to enjoy themselves, regardless of, you know, how, how many people are in the building. Uh, we're very optimistic that, that that human connection is what people need most. 
and that that'll drive people back uh, to support local restaurants and local businesses. Um, Jeff, if I could jump in. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Uh, yeah, it's too bad that uh, Mark von Schalwitz uh, was unable to attend today. Um, if uh, around the question of the cleanliness and the guidelines, um, we've been, uh, of course, we're um, part of the Hotels Association of Canada. So on their website, they've got some fantastic documents on the on health and safety within a hotel. Now, just recently, like within the last couple of days, Restaurants Canada, uh, Mark von Schellwitz, they've produced a document. Um, please go to their website. It'll be on our website uh, later today. Uh, but it's uh, COVID-19 reopening best practice practices. And it's really robust. Um, there is lots of information in there now. And that really is a framework, I think, right now. And not that it's a draft at this point. It's out. It's, it's out there for public consumption. But going off of this as a template really allows us to put together some really robust information. And what it will do is give up, you know, to Matt's point, you talk about menus. Um, but um, if you go into a restaurant, what types of things are already on a table? When I was a server, man, those tables had to be set exactly the same way with the cutlery, the whole nine yards. Maybe that now becomes a thing of the past is when you're seated, there's nothing on the table and your server, first thing they do is they wipe it down with disinfectant and you bring the cutlery with the meal. So, and that's all contained within those documents for operators to consider. So it's brand new. I didn't want to steal Mark's thunder on this, but it's a, it's a great read and it's very thought provoking. Because for those that have worked in the industry before, it's really re-examining uh, the way that we did business. Like, I never realized how much I touched my own face until I told I can't do that anymore. It's the right. same thing in restaurants, right? Like, again, service and production and supply chain, we do things um, uh, because we've done it forever. Um, that, that's part of what's going to have to change, particularly in reopening. It may settle back down depending on, uh, you know, on the virus itself. But uh, the Restaurants Canada site, uh, they've got it up on their site. We'll have it up on ours this afternoon, but some really good, um, it's a really good framework and a good starting point. Excellent. That resource sounds like it would uh, help address the gap that a lot of people are feeling right now. I know one of our panelists at our session on Tuesday, uh, Mark Heisey from Rebellion Brewing, had an observation that they had been wiping their pin pads down after every customer transaction and found that based on feedback, people didn't realize it was being cleaned. And so they adapted their practices to clean it before handing it to the customer. Same outcome, but interesting the psychology of some of this that starts to creep into things. I'm respectful of people's time and we're slightly over the hour. And I'm just wondering to bring this home. I'm curious for your parting thoughts and we'll go around the panel on our, our third question. And that is we know that a lot of the relief programs that have been out there so far have either addressed parts of the problem and have done it for a very fixed period of time. And certainly everyone I hear from is grateful that the government's moved so quickly to put these things in place. But we all know that there's a, a longer war to be waged, so to speak. Uh, the end of the beginning is what we're in, is, is what I like to say. Um, so with that in mind, and maybe we'll start with you, Amy, what additional needs are gonna need uh, to be met over the longer term and what gaps are there that need to be filled so that uh, good operators and restaurants with good businesses have a fighting chance to uh, sort of make it through the uh, finish line? Yeah, it comes down to cash. Um, for me, I, I've thought of this quite a lot and do I need this, that, the other um, grant? Um, I don't need another loan at this point. Uh, how are we gonna pay that back? It would have to be um, abatements and, and rebates and, and grants in that form. What that would look like and what form that would take, I don't know, but I'm just seeing the, the 40,000 loan I got, it's starting to dwindle. I see it running out in July myself. I don't know what anyone else's projections look like unless there's a significant uptick, uh, which I don't see happening um, in the, you know, say six months or so. Uh, so it would come down to, um, again, support. And it pains me to say that. Uh, I've never won for handouts myself, but if we're to survive, especially some of the smaller ones, the immigrant run restaurants, to keep our vibrant landscape of, of different types and, and cuisines in restaurants, you're gonna need um, cash. Thanks, Amy. Matt, how about yourself? Yeah, I'd echo that. Um, you know, I think that for me, the 75% wage subsidy uh, runs out quite soon. And uh, th that to me is something that I'm very hopeful will uh, be extended. I think it needs to be extended by three to six months, frankly. Um, you know, and back to Amy's point, that's cash, right? And that allows us to continue to keep employ employees on the payroll uh, and, and probably allows us to pay payer overhead, restore paying landlords, that sort of thing. 
Um, the commercial rent relief, a little more clarity on that would certainly help. Uh, and, you know, like, like Amy said, I don't think any further loans are going to help uh, operators like us. You know, we can't continue to take on this much debt, regardless of whether it's interest free. Um, uh, we need we need help in other ways. And, and if saddling restaurants with debt over the long term isn't really going to be overly helpful and will just lead to more failing in time. In my opinion. Yeah, it certainly echoes the comments that we're hearing from a lot of business and is even more so in an industry that's only going to be able to uh, reopen sort of in a progressive and limited way. Jim, I suppose the last word today falls to you. Yeah, this, this really is, we, you know, sticking together, making sure that we're community, uh, communicating consistent messaging, uh, whether that's to our customers or our staff or even to government. You know, we've, uh, uh, for us on the advocacy front, certainly as hard as we can on the federal government, you know, extending the wage subsidy is critical for us. Uh, provincially, you know, great program with the uh, Small Business Emergency Loan, uh, you know, talking about expansion of that. Um, hopefully that would just be the first phase, the $50 million, which, which was bigger than any other province. So we're grateful for that. But that puts money directly into the hands of operators and they can spend it on whatever they want, right? So some of these other programs are layered with complexity and it makes it really tough. Uh, the Saskatchewan program. So if we can expand those pieces and then again with the... Um, uh, with the temporary layoff piece. So there's a lot of things that we're um, working on with governments, whether it's federally or provincially, to make sure that there's liquidity so that the Amy's and the Matt's of the world are allowed to, uh, not allowed, they're able to better um, navigate these waters and come out on the other end because there's going to be a lot of expense coming up, whether it's PPE or how it is that we, um, uh, how it is that we, the service delivery model is going to have to change. So this is really all about communication and buying local. You know, um, there's some good programming around that. And, uh, you know, Matt's Good Eats and uh, Amy's opportunity to be able to move into open, open air uh, environments. These are, all, these are all going to be responsive to our customers, right? They're going to be telling us what it is. I mean, much the same as my association. My members, folks like this and then people that write in, they, they give me my marching orders. They're telling me, look, at, if we do this, can you please communicate this to government? Because if we do this, we'll be way better off. So there's a lot of layers to this. And, uh, you know, just certainly appreciate all of those folks that are considering reopening and what it is that we can do to um, um, further that. Let's communicate that out and get it out to the world. You know, I think Wednesdays are takeout Wednesdays. Um, my family is certainly all over it at least twice a week, you know. So those are the kinds of things that we can do locally to support our businesses. Thanks, Jim. And I want to thank all of our panelists, Amy, Matt, Jim. Great uh, discussion today. We went with a bit of an abbreviated uh, hour-long format. We went a bit over. I appreciate you being gracious with your time. I know uh, as a business operator and, and more so as a consumer, I think if people heard the type of conversation that operators are having and the types of things they're considering, they'd uh, have a lot of confidence in your ability to provide a safe experience. So I thank you for that. And certainly uh, one thing I've been very proud of as a Saskatchewan citizen is that no matter how hard people have been hurting, our small business operators and our restaurateurs have all been very much on the side of, we want to stay closed and keep people safe and do our part and do the right thing. And I think that's uh, going to really reflect on people in this uh, difficult chapter of our history very well in years ahead. So I thank you all for your time today. I thank everyone who's been able to join us. I know there was a number of good questions that we weren't able to address specifically, but I think we touched on many. And I wouldn't be surprised if we revisited this topic in the future. So. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and good luck in the uh, difficult weeks and months ahead. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Jeff. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.